Good morning, Christ Baptist family and friends. Today is Sunday, July 23rd, and here are your morning announcements. Our true superhero, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, we truly praise God for VBS this year. At VBS, the gospel was shared, fun was had, prayers were answered, and lives were blessed. A special thank you to the many, many volunteers who blessed us during our two weeks of VBS. Our God is an awesome God, and truly, he showed up and showed out. We give him all the praise and glory, so thank you. Get ready for the 5K Walk, Run, and Community Health Fair on September 9th from 9 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. This event is free for all ages and is open to the public. You're, you can register in the upper room after service or on the website for the 5K Walk, Run. Remember, improve your health improve your life. Free cancer screenings will be held at CBC on Tuesday, August 15th, starting at 9 a.m. Space is limited. To register, you can email or call the number that is on the screen. 828 will be hosting a field day this August. The day will consist of games, food, and fun. More information will be announced soon. A reminder to all our facilities and groups when planning events that will take place at the church. You must complete a ministry activity form and after approval, it will be placed on the church calendar. For those interested in volunteering in the feeding ministry, please see Sister Joyce Paul or contact the church office. Volunteers are asked to pick a date and a time. Available days are Monday, Thursday, and Saturday from 12 to 2 p.m. Connect with us. For those who are attending in person, ask an usher for a connect card. We want to connect with you. You can connect with us through Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. So that's all our announcements for today. Each week we say, let's get ready to worship but we really hope that you've already started to begin to begin to worship God before you come online or be before you come in service. Because truly, when we open our eyes in the morning, we should start worshiping God for waking us up. So come on and continue to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with us this morning. to first give all honor and glory and power and, and just praise to our Heavenly Father. I thank Him for who He is, and He's worthy of all the honor. I'd like to also acknowledge Pastor Bogan and Sister Deb and, as they're away on their vacation, and, and honor all of you, too, 
because it is a privilege to be able to stand before you today. Pastor Bogan was with us all through vacation Bible school. Virtually every night he was there. He missed the last night. I believe, believe they started their um, vacation. But he was there preaching and teaching and praying and whatever was needed. He was there encouraging us. But he wasn't by himself. Over 60 of you were there as well. And we just praise the Lord. Even when we went off site, when we went to St. Mary's in Burlington City, when we went to Edgewater Park, about 20 of you still journeyed on with us and took, went that extra mile. And we're just grateful for each one that was able to go. So we thank you. Before we begin the message for today, please join me in a brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you for your plans and your purposes. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us your word. We, we thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for the listening ear, for the believing heart. We pray, Lord, that something that is said during your word, during your message, will speak to someone's heart in a profound way. We're praying that you'll give them a thought, a reminder, a seed, a nugget. We're praying that they will leave here as Minister Paul says, changed, different than when they came in. We're praying from the pulpit to the door that you'll bless your word. Hide me behind the cross that you might be seen. Bless me to decrease that you might increase. Be glorified. And for that one that doesn't know you in the pardoning of their sin, help them to come to know you today. In Jesus' name, we say hallelujah. Bless your word, Lord. Amen. Amen. Our text for today is coming from Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they had set before, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Amen, amen, amen. Today's title is simply Chosen to Serve. I believe that God is looking for men and women boys and girls whose hearts are firmly fixed on him and who will continually trust him for all that he desires to do in their lives. And that God is ready to work more powerfully than ever through his people. And the time is now to position ourselves that we might be used by him. So how does God choose people to serve, you might ask. Well, I believe that God chooses not perhaps as others choose based on outward appearance or family background or social standing, but rather he chooses people just like those in here today among us, ordinary people. Ordinary people who with the power of the Holy Spirit can do extraordinary things. Remember, as believers, God has called 
and chosen us. All that is left for us to do is to accept our assignment, which God has chosen for us, be willing to get equipped, meet God's standards, and then go. The book of Acts emphasizes the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of Christ's followers. It tells how the Christian church was built through the dynamic power, that dunamis power of the Holy Spirit, working through chosen vessels. Acts begins at the same place where the gospel according to Luke chapter 24 ends. That is with the ascension of Jesus, the going back to heaven of Jesus. Those disciples and others watched the powerful events of the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. They were filled with a victorious faith and a new power as a result of the promised Holy Spirit of God coming to live now on the inside of them. Jesus had told them in Acts 1 that they would be equipped to be witnesses of him. They would need the power of God was he, because he was calling them, as he is calling us, to be witnesses of him. Our young people dance that today. A witness of him would mean that the disciples would have to share his story. We would have to share the good news of Jesus. Well, you ask, well, what is the good news of Jesus? It's telling of his virgin birth, his sinless life, his crucifixion where they beat him all night long and exposed him to an open shame. His physical death on the cross and after three days, just as he promised, his resurrection from the grave with all power in his hands and his ascension, his going back to heaven one day to return. That was the disciples' message, and that is still our message today. Now, the methods change, but the message never changed. The disciples may have had to stand on a boat and maybe just shout from the boat to the people. We can send a whole scriptural message across the globe just with our cell phones, can't we? Jesus reminds them that the power is of the Lord and that they were to wait for the power to be within them. They simply did not have the power, the ability um, on their own to be the witnesses that he called them to be. So he called these ordinary people to be set apart by the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit because it takes miraculous power to face the persecution and rejection that they would face. As believers today, this still is good counsel, isn't it? Because somebody knows that it takes the power of God to face some of the things that we have to face in this life on a daily basis. Let us seek God's face and move as he leads, trusting in his power and might and not in our own skills and abilities. We remember that the work is the Lord's and that we are just to be excited that God allows us to participate in the miracle that he is doing. In this passage, it opens, and in those days, well, these were the days, the verses in chapter 5, just before it tells us that the apostles were told not to preach nor to teach in Jesus' name. But Peter and the other disciples continued on and replied, well, we ought to always obey God rather than man. True to their threats, the Sadducees did beat them up for preaching and teaching Christ. But instead of being fearful, and this is the part that's a little hard to understand, the apostles were rejoicing. They were happy that they were counted worthy to suffer in their bodies for their faith and for preaching in his name. Well, saints, we must always hold on to our joy in our service for the Lord. Let's not give up on God or his work. Even when things are difficult and don't seem to go our way, when our dreams are seemingly deferred or even denied, when life looks as if it might be passing us by, when there are hurting situations that make us feel like giving in or giving up or giving out, we must remember that God does have a plan and a purpose for each one of us. It has been said that Christ did not send his disciples out to face persecution. He sent them out to proclaim God's word, to tell somebody about Jesus and his love for them. Well, persecution may come 
as a result. But remember, we also are also to obey God rather than man. Whenever possible, we are to live peaceably with all men. But when man stands in direct conflict against the stated laws of God, we must obey God. For many in our world today, persecution for their faith is an everyday reality. As part of the family of God, we are to pray one for another and to help when we can and where we can. Even seeing what the early church was seeing, the Holy Spirit was still drawing men and women, boys and girls unto himself. Yes, it was a time of great fear, but it was also a time of great grace. They tell us that the number of the disciples was growing, actually multiplying, that they were convinced that this was the way, that they had found the truth and the life and that his name was Jesus. They had found something that no amount of threatenings or bullyings or beatings could cause these men of faith to deny. So yes, they too wanted to be a disciple, a learner, a follower of Jesus. So a disciple of Christ believes his teacher's doctrine, rests in his sacrifice, and is indwelt with and drinks in of the Holy Spirit. He also imitates his teacher's example. As disciples, we are to learn from what Jesus taught and did and grow to be more like him. The Jews considered themselves to be disciples of Moses, and that's what caused a problem between them and the Christians. The gospel message was causing the church to grow. There were many disciples, and the number just kept increasing. Well, we're hoping that God will do that same thing right here at Christ Baptist one day, and somebody knows that it is possible, because God is able. Interestingly, after the book of Acts, the word disciple is not used again at all in the New Testament. During Jesus' time on earth, the title disciple referred more to his followers' relationship to him. But after his ascension, after he went back to heaven, after his departure, the words the followers used um, was more of a relationship to one another. Therefore, you find the word brethren, or you find the word saint. Verse 1 tells us that in the days when the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring. Well, you know what a murmur is, don't you? It almost sounds like the way it is written. Murmur, 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 murmur. It's a low sound of displeasure or discontent. It's not spoken loudly enough or clearly enough to be well understood, but it catches your attention that somebody is not happy. Well, with great growth or increase comes great challenges sometimes. Problems and complaints occurred from without the church and from within the church. So when we hosted just one week of vacation Bible school here at the church, we had certain expected expenses. But when we went to that second week, we were now at two different locations. We didn't know how many people to prepare for, and the expenses multiplied. This particular issue was that it was the responsibility of the church to provide for widows indeed, or the poor, or the disabled that did not have family members that could take care of them, or that they couldn't take care of themselves. So within the first church, there were Greek-speaking Jews, known as Hellenistic Jews, and Hebrews who spoke Aramaic. Well, this verse points to a rift between the two sections of the church. The Hellenistic Jews felt their widows were being neglected, not getting the same treatment or allotment as the Hebrew Jews' widows were, and they were upset about it which is the reason for the murmuring. Perhaps your widows got more food or clothing allotment or money than our widows did. So initially, it may have been only 20 widows in the congregation. But as the church kept growing and multiplying, now maybe it was 40 widows or 60 or even 100 or more. So the apostles had a major decision to make. Ignore the complaining or ask for wisdom from God to come up with a solution that may be fair to all and that would strengthen the church. 
The 12 could have been what some would have thought to be super spiritual and say, well, okay, we'll sacrifice ourselves and add a little something else to the over full plate that we already have and we'll do it. We'll feed the widows ourselves. But instead, being full of wisdom and with the leading of the Holy Spirit, they called the congregation together and said that it was not reason for them to leave the word of God and go serve tables. Now, they were not saying that serving tables was beneath them. It wasn't. They just recognized their specific assignment and the roles that they were to play in the plan of God at that time. So that there would not even be a hint of favoritism or prejudice, they made a Solomonic decision. In verse 3, they told the congregation to choose from among themselves. Listen to what the requirements were. Seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. And then they would appoint them over that business. So what benefit would it have to be to the congregation to choose these officers? Largely, that as the congregation possibly knew the individual even better than the disciples. You see, they lived among them, and that makes a difference. They saw them when they were hungry. Sometimes we're different people when we're hungry. They saw them when they were hungry, they were tired, they were angry. They knew them as well as it is to know another person. So what was the result of this decision? The apostles laid their hands on the seven chosen men, commissioned them to serve, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. The word was spread, the needs of the congregation was met, and a great company, even of religious priests, came to believe that Jesus really was the long-awaited Messiah, the source of eternal salvation. So they chose the way of faith. Three quick thoughts. One, what does it mean to be of honest report? Two, how do we become full of the Holy Spirit? And three, what is wisdom? So to be of honest report, King James says honest report, means that we have a good reputation among others, that they are considered honorable, well-respected, true to your word, who they see on Sunday as the same person that they see on Tuesday or Saturday night or at school with your friends. So these men were chosen because they had an honest report. So how do we power up and be full of the Holy Spirit? Well, our Vacation Bible School t-shirts that I've worn every day for the last nine days um, shared with us about praying, trusting God, studying his word, believing it, believing his promises, obeying God's word, and yielding our own way to God's way. We are to confess any known sins, be forgiven. We are to trust that he is who he said he is. So when we sing or dance that he's Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, we have to really trust that he really is. So what is wisdom? Simply put, it is the proper application of knowledge. Not just having knowledge for knowledge's sake. Book smart, but no wisdom and sometimes no common sense. The Bible teaches us that wisdom comes from above. It begins with the fear of the Lord. Wisdom is the soundness of an action or decision with regards to the application of experience, knowledge, and good judgment. When many of us were young, we probably thought that we knew more than our parents or our teachers. But as time went on, we realized that we did not know all that we needed to know. We made some mistakes. And hopefully we learn from those mistakes and would make different choices now. Thank God we have an advocate that intercedes for us when we sin. And if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. James 3, 15 to 17 tells us that wisdom from above is different from man's earthly, unspiritual, even demonic wisdom where jealousy and self ambition exists. The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Stephen was singled out in verse 8 as being full of faith and power, 
doing great wonders and signs among the people. It's been said that there are three levels of faith in the Christian experience. Level one is that we believe only when we see some sign or have strong emotions or feelings that things are going to work out. The second level believes even when all feelings are absent. I don't feel it, but I'm going to believe anyway. And the third level goes beyond the first two because it believes in God and his word even when circumstances and all else, emotions, appearances, people, and human reason all seem to urge something to the contrary. May God grant us that kind of faith to completely trust his word even when every other sign seems to point the other way. I believe that God would have each believer give themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word, not just the Wednesday night prayer warriors, the deacons or the ministerial staff. First Peter 2.5 tells us that Christ has made us a priesthood of believers. And if we can no longer go to the nursing home or serve at the feed ministry or go to the prisons, well, we can still pray. We can still share Christ with those in our own home or go across the street or call someone or send a card, as Sister Joyce mentioned. We are to learn as much of God's word as we can and then speak it, study it, love it, lift it, and set it free. We can, once it's set in motion, God's word can do some great things. Every believer has been chosen to serve in some capacity. Everyone's not going to be in the same capacity. I urge you to give yourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word and do whatever it is that God reveals for you to do for the upbuilding of his kingdom. 1 Corinthians 12 reminds us that there are diversities of gifts in the body of Christ, and we will not all do the same thing. In our recent vacation Bible school, I saw this right in front of me. Held over the last two weeks, it took all of our va various gifts. Some beautifully decorated the hallways, while others set up tents and loaded the trucks with tables and chairs. Some taught the adults, while others taught the children and had them decorate capes and do craft or science projects. Others encouraged attendees to power up with Jesus and prayed with anybody that walked by and requested prayer. Some sang, played music, set up AV equipment, flew drones, took photos, created videos. Others made announcements, ran off and distributed flowers, flyers and sign-in sheets. Some of them wrote checks and paid our bills with your offerings took registration, made sandwiches, and handed out bag lunches, coupons and candy. Some monitored the parking lot and building while others monitored us for heat exhaustion and cleaned up scrapes and bruises and loose baby teeth. Others organized or supervised fun games. Some donated coupons for brand new sneakers while others donated freely over 100 new backpacks with school supplies. Some, hallelujah, some preach the word of God, stressing that God is greater than anything or anyone, and that Jesus, the Alpha and Omega, is our real superhero. Amen. Decisions for Christ were made. Lives were forever changed. Thank you, one and all, for serving Christ by serving others. In closing, remember you have been chosen to serve. So let's all accept our individual assignments. Let us get equipped and go. To God be the glory. Great things he has done and is yet doing. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. The doors of the church are open. The doors of the church are open. John chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever 
believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 17 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Thank you. 